Dr. Begeli Chalisa, and we're proud that she's here. She came all the way from Botswana. Uh, she was on the plane probably for 24 hours. Uh, Dr. Chalisa has a doctorate in policy, planning, and evaluation from the University of Pittsburgh, and her master's is in research methodology from the same institutions. Her 2012 book, Indigenous Research Methodologies, has made her one of the most outstanding researchers in this field. People all over the country here are using this textbook. She is one of the founding members of the Botswana, Lesotho, Swaziland, and Namibia Research Association, and has served as president of the Botswana Educational Research Association. She is the editor of the Botswana Educational Research Journal and a board member of the University of Botswana Center for Scientific Research and Indigenous Knowledge and Innovations and the University of Botswana Ethics Committee. She is the first woman professor of education at the University of Botswana, where she teaches research methods and evaluation courses. Professor Chalisa is formally appointed a visiting professor at the University of Johannesburg and is internationally known for her expertise in indigenous research methodologies. We want to thank Imbri again for agreeing to fund Dr. Chalisa. So please give her a warm Montana welcome. Okay. Okay. Um, it's really an honor to be here. I've heard so much about uh, this area, and uh, I say this area because I, I'm, I'm scared of maybe not uh, uh, using the right words. Um, I have read a lot and I've read a lot about Native Americans, indigenous peoples. So when I was invited to come and give this keynote address, I thought it was an opportunity, a great opportunity to meet the people. And yesterday I had the opportunity of also visiting the land and talking to the land. And when we were visiting the land, I did uh, ask uh, the ancestors here to give me the courage to speak the right words so that I can be heard. Um, as when I thought of this uh, keynote, I said to myself, what, is, what am I going to talk about? I tried to rehearse, it didn't come out right. I kept on rehearsing, it didn't come out right. And then I did slides and then I really was confused. So this morning I talked to a friend and she said to me, just tell, tell us about yourself. And I thought, well, that is much easier. That is where I'm going to start. Um, I'm supposed to be an expert in indigenous research methodologies. I don't think of myself that way, but I can tell you that uh, for me, indigenous research methodologies started a long time back when I was, when I was, when I was going, going to secondary school. And my father was my hero. My father and mother were my heroes in terms of uh, initiating me into these indigenous research methodologies, what we call indigenous research methodologies. My father was very, very critical of uh, us as children when we were growing up. When I was growing up, when I went to secondary school, I went to a mission school, a Catholic mission school, and uh, there came time that I had to be baptized. And I wrote my father and told my father that uh, the priest wanted me to have an English name, and asked, I asked my father to give me an English name. 
So she said to me, uh, you are not ever going to get an English name. Your name is Baigele, that is your name, and that is it. Anyway, the priest went ahead and gave me my name. My name is Rose, but that Rose never, never was known by anybody. Then, you see, I'm very dark, by the way, and so when I was growing, there was this uh, skin lightening creams that made you lighter. So when I went to secondary school, my father gave me a hard talk, told me, never, never change your identity. You are dark. Uh, you are my black beauty. When you come back from school, I want you to be what I see you today. So for me, that was really the start of uh, decolonizing knowledge systems. It was uh, the start of resistance against uh, Western knowledge. And so it continued uh, to uh, university. I went to the University of Botswana for my first degree. And at that time, South Africa was fighting for independence. So a lot of our lecturers were actually freedom fighters. And you know, we looked at the history where we're told John Cecil Rose discovered, uh, found the Rhodesia, and Rhodesia named after Cecil John Rose, the imperialist. So the, the, the lecturers were quick to tell us that uh, those, uh, Cecil John Rose was an imperialist, and that uh, naming Rhodesia, Rhodesia, was, uh, uh, was, was actually cultural imperialism. So I started learning a lot of imperialism, uh, a lot of isms. I learned about colonialism, I learned about imperialism, and all these isms were really bad isms. And then I was brought up to resist this cultural imperialism. So then I went to the University of Pittsburgh to do my doctoral degree. And the, the lecturers were really interesting. So uh, one day we were doing uh, evaluation research and this professor was talking, uh, uh, started talking about uh, our, our heroes, our forefathers, and he started talking of uh, George Washington. And I said, okay, so he was a hero. Oh, how come he kept slaves? And so everybody was so shocked that I could ask such a question. <laughs> and so, I, well, I, I, I like, okay, everybody's looking at me, what, what, did she ask that question? Did she ask that question? But of course, I, 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 I've heard about uh, the, the Bell of Liberty, uh, where it is said that uh, it was uh, George Washington's, it, it was on George Washington's birthday uh, party, uh, the slaves were, 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 of course, doing the slave work, and then uh, somebody was ringing the bell, and the bell got a crack, and that crack never got mended. So those are the stories I had. But then you see, the, the good thing about the University of Pittsburgh was that they didn't like uh, think there was anything wrong with me asking. They thought it was a point it was a standpoint. I was talking from a certain point of view. They encouraged a lot of critical thinking. And I used to enjoy to see the professors uh, debating on uh, research paradigms. At that time, there was uh, this big debate between the research paradigm, the, uh, the qualitative paradigm, which is uh, the indigenous, uh, I mean, the qualitative paradigm, uh, sometimes called the interpretive or constructivist paradigm, and the post-positivist, which, uh, which is quantitative. And the professors would debate to, to an extent that I would think, oh my God, they're going to fight. So all these things made me think, okay, so you can always debate your standpoint. And so when I left the University uh, of Pittsburgh to go to, uh, uh, Botswana. The first thing when I got there, uh, it, I was uh, confronted with a huge problem. Uh, uh, there was the HIV uh, pandemic, and 
I had to be one of the researchers. Uh, one of the first researches that we, we did was the impact of HIV AIDS on, on, on the education system. So I found myself doing this research. And you know, we in developing countries don't have a lot of money. So normally we partner with uh, people from outside. So we're partnering with some people from the UK. And there we were doing this research and this, uh, this other person who called himself the principal investigator, he came up with this review of literature and this review of literature, he talked about how, uh, uh, the literature talked about, about how the pandemic was getting worse because of uh, 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 the Botswana slav for uh, uh, sex and so on and so on. And all the stereotypes you could imagine. So I said, oh my God. So it's, it's now I'm doing this research and I am, people are going to read this? I said, hey. You see, now you are not talking about them, Botswana only. You are talking about me. All these stereotypes you are, you are citing from the literature, it's about me. I can't possibly write about myself in that manner. Tony said, yeah, no, 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 no. It's, 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 this, is, this, is, this is literature. Uh, we are going to cite a verbatim from the literature. And we cannot ignore the literature. So that was my starting point. Okay, so this is this research. This is how they are describing us in Botswana. This is how uh, we want to portray the problem of HIV AIDS by labeling, naming, uh, and so on. So from that day on, I say to myself, uh, there has to be other ways of doing research. There has to be other ways of re doing research. And from that uh, time on, I started uh, thinking hard about how I can write about research, describe people in a manner that will see themselves in the descriptions that I make, in a manner that will uh, make people recognize who they are. And so that was the start of my, my thinking about research. So today, as I reflected and thought about how to begin, uh, I, I want to continue uh, telling you stories that make me do what I do and that make me write what I write. So this story is about not representing people in a manner that they would like to see themselves continue. In the mountain kingdom of Swaziland in South Africa, a certain professor by the name of Carol Saches from the University of Pennsylvania wanted to increase crop yield amongst the people by using fertilizers. Unfortunately for her research, there was no increase in the crop yields. And so what did this professor think? This professor thought, well, they looked at the fields and they felt that there was a lot of weed. And they said, uh, they concluded that the yields, the low yields, were either due to the fact that the women were too lazy to weed the fields, or the women were too busy because of the multiple roles that they played. Later on, five years later, a student went back to Swaziland, and this uh, student was studying diet. And the student realized that uh, one of the findings uh, from this student was that that which the professor from the University of Pennsylvania had called the weed was not really, those were not really weeds, but they were plants that the women used uh, for, uh, as a source, an important source of vitamin A for their families. 
And then in Kenya, again, uh, there are refugees in Kenya. Uh, researchers wanted to find out the needs of the refugees. And they used uh, Maslow's theory of hierarchical needs to identify the needs of these people. So, but then they, they used the story method. They asked these people to tell, tell stories. So when they analyzed the stories, they found that none of uh, uh, this hierarchical needs was of consequence, was of importance to the people. What was important to the people, instead of the, the shelter, the food, what was important to the people was relationships. The refugees say that relationships were important because if they had poor relationships with their neighbors, it was the poor relationship with their neighbors that brought conflict, that brought war. So for them, shelter was not that important. So today, I'm asking you, what is your story? For you to be able to do indigenous research methodologies, there must be a story that is driving you to do what you want to do. What is your story? One of my stories was in 2005. That is when I really came in conflict with Western knowledge. I was writing a book. My first book is uh, Research Methods for Adult Educators in Africa. And uh, the, the book kept on going to the editors. And one of the editors uh, had this. This is in quotes. There are difficulties in getting Africans involved in the theorizing and building of knowledge on ways of conducting research. You have to address questions such as, how do you test the validity of your findings by African or Western standards? What language do you use to build a research community? And how do you research, store, and transmit the accumulated knowledge? Arguably, the whole idea of research belongs to the Northwestern paradigm. So probably, some Africanness will have to be sacrificed in the process. So these were comments from uh, an editor who was editing the book. And, uh, and that was in 2005, and I said, well, when I finish this book, I'm going to see whether I cannot address uh, those questions that are raised by the editor. So, in t uh, just now, uh, I was asked to uh, write about evaluation practices that originate, uh, that are rooted in African worldviews and paradigms. And so I went about in, uh, interviewing people, uh, and, and there was this response from a well-known uh, uh, evaluator from the US, and this is what he said. Africa is too diverse to constitute a monolithic world view, in my opinion. There is no American approach to evaluation, or Canadian, or European approach, or Australian approach. Diversity is manifest in all aspects. And, uh, he, uh, the bottom line is that uh, an, Af an African view uh, doesn't exist. Don't force it. It is not useful. So, I, of course, for me, I always uh, defy. And indigenous research methodologies are, for me, they're about resistance, the resistance to Western knowledge. So I, 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 I defied that and said, well, uh, if you look at the... Uh, evaluation book, uh, one of the evaluation book, they have what they call an evaluation tree metaphor. And that evaluation tree metaphor, it has names of big evaluators uh, from the US, the majority of them from the US. And so I said to myself, oh my God, uh, does it mean that we cannot have uh, an African that, uh, uh, that originates an evaluation model from an African worldviews? So I said, uh, and, and it so happened that that uh, evaluation 
uh, tree was in a journal, and in that journal, uh, the, 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 the writer was actually talking about the, the non-visibility of uh, evaluators uh, from, from Africa, from indigenous peoples, First Nations, and so on and so on. And my point was, okay, they are not there, they may not be there because uh, the way the, the, the tree the tree is formulated, is designed, is such that it is exclusive. So I went on and defied that and said, I'm going to come up with an African evaluation tree. So I just uh, drew this evaluation tree, and in this evaluation tree, I show Africans who are using African worldviews to do evaluation. So in that way, I'm saying, uh, Indigenous research methodologies, indigenous evaluation methodologies, they are about uh, coming with alternatives of doing research, uh, research that emanates from the world views of our people. Okay. So, as I said, the lessons learned from these stories, what we learn from these stories is that uh, usually, for instance, uh, the research in Swaziland about the weeds, uh, it, it, it shows that most of the time as researchers, uh, we, are, we, 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 we take ourselves as knowers and our participants as ignorant. Uh, most of the time we know and uh, it shows we don't involve our participants in, in the research process. So indigenous research methodologies are, are participatory. They're about bringing uh, uh, people, the participant as knowers, bringing the participant as uh, uh, important people in the construction of your research, in the data collection, in the interpretation, and so on. And when, for what, what you read from the story shows that uh, uh, it's, it's also an indication of Euro-Western knowledge as superior and the other as inferior. And uh, from the stories, also what you see is that our, uh, we see the, the research is fixed. Researchers have fixation of researchers with indigenous cultures, African cultures, First Nation cultures, and all this whole thing of deficit theorizing. You see. Uh, we didn't get enough crop yield because there were weeds, there were weeds because these people are lazy and so on and so on. And uh, all the labeling and negative stereotyping of these cultures. And of course, uh, the stories also demonstrate academic imperialism. And of course, academic imperialism is when we conceptualize our research based on the world literature. Uh, you know, when our students uh, do research, you ask the student to go and do research, go and do research. And when you, uh, I mean, to go and review literature. And when you review literature, you want, you want the student to be able to say what others have said, what methodologies others have used. And what if those other methodologies are methodologies that are not good for the people? What if those, uh, the literature that the, the, the student reviews is literature that, is, uh, that, uh, that, uh, st that, that labels negative stereotyping and so on and so on? So, uh, uh, and the language also, you do the literature, uh, that literature, you do it, it's in a certain language. What if that language is exclusive of some of the concepts that you'd otherwise find in the, uh, in the local uh, people's language system? So, these are the lessons from uh, the stories. And what we are really saying is that we are captive. We are captive. We are captive of the four research paradigms. When we do research, our research is informed by the four, by the four paradigms. The post-positive, post which is quantitative, the interpretive, which is uh, uh, qualitative, the transformative, which is merely mixed method, and the pragmatic, which is uh, problem solving. And what we are saying is that for you to say it's a paradigm, when we do research, when I was doing research at the University of Pittsburgh, we used to say, from, from, from where are you standing? And the standing was that these paradigms are mountains. 
And how you see, what you see, what you observe, what you write about, it depends on your view. If you are climbing a high, high mountain, you will see a lot. And if your mountain is low, you will see less. And so, our argument is that in the indigenous research paradigm, our indigenous research methodologies, our argument is that these mountains, these, uh, these four mountains, they do not give us enough view of what we need to see and write about. So, the captive mind, are we willing to change? Because if you are going to do indigenous research methods, you need to change. We hear from the, uh, the Malaysian sociologist Said Alatas, who developed the concept, the captive mind, to refer to an uncritical imitation of Western paradigm within scientific intellectual activity. And we hear also of Onan describing a, a process that is called colonization of the mind. As I said, I was lucky because as I was growing up, my father started the decolonize, decolonization of the mind. And uh, it has helped me to see uh, beyond uh, what the Western paradigm would allow me to, to see. You see, it's as if we have a contract with this paradigm. And my KG challenges all researchers to debate whether the social science methodologies that originated in the West and are indigenous to the West are necessarily universal for the rest of the world. Are these paradigms universal for the rest of the world? And that is the question that indigenous research, researchers pose. And when they pose this, they have to pose this and provide alternatives. And so indigenous methodologies are a recognition that the four paradigms cannot be universal to the whole world. So then we come to, to talk about what is it that indigenous research methodologies uh, seek to do. It's, it's about doing research that positively impact on the quality of life of our communities. That is the major thing. What is the research that you are doing? Eh? Is it the research that is derived from the book? You know, uh, my, uh, our as professors, we normally say to a student, if you don't, if you can't come up with a research a research topic, uh, go and read journals and see uh, what other people suggest should be done. Is that the way to do it? Is, that, is, is, what, is what researchers suggest in their journals, in the, in the end of chapter, recommendations, chapter, is that, what, is that the research that researchers need to do? So, Indigenous research methodologies, they are not only about the techniques of gathering data. They are about what is it that you are researching. Yesterday, it was so, I was so thrilled to hear about the research on uranium. For me, I thought this was research that would have an impact on the lives of the people. But of, of course, I also had questions. Uh, how did the research come about? Uh, did it come from the researchers' uh, observations, or was it also was was that also a dialogue? Was there also a dialogue with the communities? What is it? What is it that you want to come out of research? What do the communities say? Surely they do have a voice. So the question is. Is our research researcher-centric? And researcher-centric is research that is really about the researcher. It's more about satisfying the needs of the researchers. So to improve on the quality of lives of our people, how do we do this research? How do we, how do we come to do research that comes from the people and not necessarily our research? And of course, 
how do you conduct research without only using Western constructs, Western terms, academic language? And when we talk about the indigenous research methodologies, we are asking the question, what is the contribution of our languages to the building of indigenous conceptual and theoretical framework, the design of interventions to improve the quality of life? Yesterday, it was also interesting to hear about uh, the Hawaiian research uh, and to hear about an, uh, a, a, a Hawaiian research methodology that stems from the language, from the concepts, from, from the metaphors, from the proverbs. That is what we want to see. And I got so excited when I heard that because I started imagining uh, this tree, hey, uh, an indigenous research tree that shows uh, a, a Hawaiian methodology, an African methodology based on, on this and that, and so on and so on and so on. So if I were to define indigenous research methodologies, how would I define it? I define it as family of research methodologies that draw from indigenous knowledge, histories, languages, metaphors, worldviews, philosophies, and experiences of former, former colonized, historically marginalized communities to critique mainstream methodologies. We have to critique mainstream methodologies to decolonize and indigenize mainstream methodologies and to envision other ways of doing research and claiming space for a fifth paradigm. We have to claim space for a fifth paradigm. So what are the characteristics of this indigenous research methodology? It is participatory. If it is indigenous, it is participatory. That is, we are saying for a long time, the voices of the participants, the voices of the local people, including my voice as researcher, have been marginalized. And so it, uh, it is participatory and it touches local phenomena. We don't want you, we want you to, 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 to go to a community and study a local phenomenon, like study your uranium in, uh, in the area, in the community. It is context sensitive and creates local constructs, methods and theories derived from local experiences and indigenous knowledge systems. And as I say, the Hawaiian example was a good example. We are already doing it and the more we do it, the better and we can get better and better at it, so much that we'll start to have multiple uh, methodologies, and, and even though a methodology like the Hawaiian methodology may have been developed in Hawaii, it does not mean that it can, it can be adapted in Botswana, it can be adapted in uh, Australia, and so on. But you see, we indigenous peoples, we formally colonized, we know how it is to be excluded. Therefore, an indigenous research methodology is not exclusive of other knowledge systems because if it does, then it loses the value, our value as, as indigenous people, as, as uh, First Nations, as African people, our values of uh, embracing others. Indigenous research methodologies, they can be uh, integrative, that is combining Western and indigenous theories. And they can also be uh, predominantly indigenous. You can combine, and sometimes when you combine methods, one method is dominant. So in some cases when you combine, the indigenous methodologies can be dominant. Yes, next. So 
I want to talk of indigenous research methodologies. I therefore think of this tree, and I'm, a, and I'm thinking one day this tree will have branches, so many branches, and each of those branches will illustrate a model, a methodology. It may be from the Native Americans here, it may be from Australia, it may be from New Zealand. So basically, what we are saying is that uh, you see this tree, it has, it has the stem, uh, the roots, and the roots are the indigenous knowledge system, the philosophies, the histories, the cultures. And um, we are saying, I'm saying that these, they breed, they result in a paradigm. I know that uh, Sean has called this paradigm an indigenous research paradigm. I have called it a post-colonial indigenous research paradigm. Basically, it is a paradigm that takes the world views of indigenous peoples all over the world. It takes the strengths that are common, there are certain common strengths across this indigenous people, and it comes up with a paradigm. Now, a paradigm is very broad, but it's the beginning of methodologies that you can envision. You can envision a methodology based on a Hawaiian method, uh, 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 a Hawaiian worldview. You can envisage a methodology based on African worldview. You can envision a, a, a methodology based on uh, the Maori. Like for instance, the Maori, they have a methodology that is based on the Maori worldview. So why don't we paint this tree such that we have so many of these branches that illustrate what we are doing? So on the other branch, we have the decolonizing and indigenizing. And decolonizing and indigenizing is, of course, combining Western and uh, uh, indigenous. Now, we talk of a worldview. We talk of, uh, uh, an, uh, I'm going to illustrate an African worldview and talk about how an African worldview can inform, inform research. So that when you go and talk about your own worldview, you can see how that worldview can inform how you can do research. So the African worldview talk of a relational ontology that is reality that is built on relationships. It talks of relational epistemology, relational axiology, it talks of cosmology, connectedness and interdependence of all things in the universe. And it talks of teleology, which is things don't just happen. There is an intended goal for research. If you do your research, if it's indigenous, you have to say, what is the goal of this research? Is it serving the community? And of course, the African thought, the African renewal, African renaissance, the rebirth, we as African, I am an African. So relational ontology is about our connectedness, uh, connected with the universe. Like for instance, I, am, I have a totem. My totem is a crocodile, so I cannot kill a crocodile. I revere it and I see myself, I associate myself with the crocodile, you know, that the, the furious animal, it can swallow you. So I'm, I'm, I'm very defiant. And, and that comes from who I am as a, as a woman of the crocodile lineage. So 
if, if uh, in Botswana, we all, everybody has uh, a totem. You are connected to this animal or that animal, and that animal helps to shape who you are. And when you do research and when you do interventions, you have to make sure that those interventions, they don't go into to interfere with my connectedness with that which you want to change. Of course, uh, in our ontological assumption, we say that we have this emphasis on I am because we are. And amongst our people, amongst the Bantu people, this I am because we are comes from the proverb, Ntu Ntu I am because we are. The importance of our relationships, our relationships not only to other people, but our relationships with the universe, our, uh, our relationship with the environment. And so if you construct it with the, uh, uh, what is it, the Western way of thinking, the, the, the Western way of thinking, they say, I am, therefore I am. It's all about me. And we say, we are M because we are, and uh, our relationships guide, guide us. They self-respect for others, for the community, for nature in general. And that is based also on the philosophy of Ubuntu. Ubuntu. Epistemology. What in a relational epistemology is simply refers to knowledge as a web of connections which inform what is known and how it can be known. And coming to know means capturing the lived realities of post-colonial indigenous communities with all their social, cultural, spiritual, moral, ecological goals and aspirations. I loved that presentation on the insects. She said she also collected information about people's beliefs about the insect. And their belief that the insects have some power also informed how she did the research. And of course, when you do research, research is, all, is about, also about values. How do you value, uh, how does uh, uh, Ubuntu, I am because we are, how does it influence how we do research? And the emphasis is in creating ethical protocols that draw from cultural practices informed by connectedness and a web of relationships that include connections with the living and the non-living. So when you do research, I am because we are. I am because we are. When you do research, indigenous research, who are you researching? Okay. Where do you place yourself in terms of the people that you are researching? So, doing research, uh, the, the ethical implications of research from an indigenous perspective plays a lot of responsibility on the researcher. You have a lot of responsibility as a researcher. And you have to be asking yourself, do I challenge, critique, and resist dominant discourses that marginalize those who suffer oppression? Who am I writing about? Are you writing about others or self or both? And what needs to be rewritten? This is the ethics of an indigenous uh, research from an indigenous perspective. You have to be asking yourself, why are you doing this research? Who will benefit from it? And you know, Smith has this question to, to, to ask. Who will formulate the research questions, decide on the methodology, the way the data is analyzed, and the, and the way the, the research is carried out? Those are critical questions from a value perspective. When you do from an ethical perspective, if you are doing indigenous research, to what extent are the people participating? We have already talked about the literature. When you read the literature, are you challenging the prejudices that arise from the literature that you read? 
what is the body of uh, indigenous knowledge that can resist or challenge the deficit theories and the deficit literature that you read. You draw from the folklore. Like for instance, in Botswana, you know, they always talk about how the African culture is oppressive of women. But you see, we use, when we do feminist, feminist research, we use the story of origin. And the story of, of origin, according to the st story of origin, for instance, men and women came from, from, a, from a, 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 a hill. And when they came out, they were both driving cattle. They were walking side by side. That is equality. And that is how we have seen, that is how we as Africans have, 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 uh, have seen the role of women. But you see, when the Western theories theorize about, about uh, gender, they will tell you, hey, the culture is oppressive. Not from our, our folklore. Maybe in the process, things change. But we have our folklore to draw from in order to address any gender stereotypes that arise. So the research built on our aim because we are. There's appreciation of the individual, there's community consent, there is group consent, there is family consent, there is respect for heritage, and there is collective consent. And of course, when we talk of our indigenous research methodologies, we are also talking about the rigor. Hey, rigor is important, and we are saying, even from our perspective, from an indigenous perspective, we can talk of rigor. And the rigor, it starts with a call for recognition of conceptual theoretical framework, methods, ethics protocols that are derived from the research frames of reference. That is rigor. We emphasize also on fairness because the African uh, culture on our aim because we are, it respects social justice. There's respect for the other. There's fairness. There's self-reflexivity. The standpoint judgment and community and participants are arbitrators of quality. Eh? Not this quality that only comes from the researcher. If you are going to describe me in a manner that I cannot recognize myself, and you say there is validity, from an indigenous perspective, there is no validity. And therefore, from an indigenous perspective, when you start to, uh, when you start to acknowledge communities also as arbitrators of quality, then there is rigor. And you see, the whole thing about indigenous research methodologies is also being able to derive uh, uh, indigenous validity that is built on indigenous concepts. And here we draw from uh, uh, the Swahili uh, and African language and African culture to talk about validity, where we say validity is ukwili, which is truth, kwajuatela, which is commitment, or tulivo, which is peacefulness and harmony and ohaki, which is justice and fairness. And validity is community. It's all about community. Imagine research that brings uh, conflict between communities. Then it's not valid research. Validity is when there is peace, when there is harmony. And that is validity from the perspective of an indigenous perspective. Now, when you look at the African worldview, Carol came up with some questions that can, you can use to guide how you do research. And these questions 
are based on the African worldview of a relational ontology, a relational epistemology, and relational values. And one of the, quest the first questions, how do you do research? How does the research you do reflect the interdependence, interconnectedness, nature of the African reality? And I think the African reality is similar to the reality here, if I'm to use the example of the insect. How does the research accommodate spiritual, the spiritual and the material reality? Among some people, like when before you start a research, you have to perform some ritual. How does this research access the non-material? That is, what methods are you going to use to access the non-material non non reality that is part and parcel of the people? And how does the research advance the interests of the community? How does this research contribute in our from our perspective to the African Renaissance. That is the methodology based on an African reality. So in general, in general, the indigenous research methodologies, they are participatory, they are transformative, and they, are, they draw from indigenous knowledge system from the philosophies, epistemologies, worldviews, ideologies, and languages of indigenous people. Res uh, the, uh, the researchers and participants are partners. When you do your indigenous research, uh, ask yourself, are you partnering with the community? What is the role of the community? And you use mixed methods. It's not like it has to be quantitative, qualitative only. It has to be a mix of quantitative and qualitative. And the techniques include methods based on ethnophilosophy, storytelling, cultural facts, talking circles, theater, drama, dance, song, and so on. So I'm going to illustrate here a research that we, I did with a couple of friends that was uh, done from an indigenous perspective. So the research was uh, R24 grant uh, that we, I was, for which I was the principal investigator and the research was funded by the National Institute of Health from the US. So this research, because of the HIV AIDS pandemic, uh, we wanted to do interventions that will uh, prevent the spread of HIV AIDS and the spread of sexual transmitted diseases amongst adolescents. And we are partnering with the university of Pennsylvania. So our starting point was therefore our theoretical lens because I was the PI, I was going to insist. Our theoretical lens was doing research from the point of view of decolonizing the, the mind, decolonizing the methodologies, and building relationships. That was the starting point. How are we going to decolonize the minds of the researchers from the University of Pennsylvania who were operating from a Western perspective? And how are we going to build relationships with our communities? That was the starting point. And whose research was it going to be? Was it going to be research that is, whose research questions 
uh, mainly from us as researchers, or were we going to involve the parents of the adolescents in this uh, research? So, our research started with agreeing on how we were going to involve the communities and how we would involve the communities. And so the first thing we did was to think of forming community a community advisory board. So we created a community advisory board that was going to uh, be the voice of the communities as we carried out, as we went on with our research. And then the second stage was, okay, so what is it to, uh, what did we want to find out? We really wanted to find out uh, and we wanted to design interventions that would, would encourage uh, adolescents to abstain until they were grown up so that they, could, they did not get uh, HIV AIDS. If they did not abstain, they had to condomize. And if they, if, if, if they had uh, partners, they had to have one partner. So the issue was that there, were, there, there was uh, 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 the rates of HIV infection among the adolescents was growing because this, uh, the adolescents did not have positive views about the prevention methods, the condomize, the abstain, the one partner. But that was just the thinking from the literature. So we wanted to design an intervention that would be informed by the voices of the adolescents. But at the same time, we were uh, our sponsor was of uh, interventions that were theory driven. You have to do, uh, your intervention has to be theory driven. So there we were. How do we have an intervention that is theory driven and at the same time is accommodative of indigenous knowledge, local knowledge? So what we did was of course to start up with uh, we, we, we decided, the University of Pennsylvania say that, well, the best uh, theory was the behavioral theory, the theory of planned behavior. If we use the theory of planned behavior as a starting point, it would give us the data that would enable us to design interventions. Okay, so we took the theory of planned behavior. So according to the theory of planned behavior, there are certain things that you have to ask and you have to ask them in a certain way. You have to say what is good about uh, what is good about condom, what is bad about condoms, what uh, uh, what is hard about using a, co a condom, uh, uh, and so on and so on. So we, uh, they insisted that we ask the questions in that structured manner. But we thought that you see, asking the questions in that structured manner may exclude other voices. So we decided that we should use a combination of indigenous method and mainstream method methods. So for the indigenous methods, we went out and collected stories uh, that the adolescents ha had heard about abstinence, what is bad about abstinence, what is good about abstinence, what stories do they hear, what stories, what are the proverbs that, are, that inform how they get to engage in, in uh, uh, sexuality, what, what are the prophets, what are the metaphors, what are the traditional songs that they hear and, and know and, and hear about sexuality. And it was amazing the amount of information we got from the proverbs, from the folklore, from the stories, and we found that what we got there was not what we could get from the structured interviews. So what we did was to, to combine the questions from the structured uh, theory of planned behavior and the other methods, indigenous methods, to design a survey questionnaire 
and we found that this survey questionnaire was cultural relevant and cultural appropriate for the community, for the group, and so on. But we had a community advisory board. We also had to go to the community advisory board and say, this is what we are finding, and this is the questionnaire. And guess what? They were, the community advisory board would not allow us to ask certain questions in certain ways. So they reviewed our questionnaires, saying that the scientific way of asking about uh, the adolescents engaging in sex were inappropriate. So we had to find ways and they had to uh, also uh, show us ways of doing that. So there we were, now we have a questionnaire and uh, in the second phase we, 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 you, we, we, we piloted the questionnaire uh, and mainly that was to find out whether the frequency of the behaviors that we found from the qualitative data. And on the basis of that, we designed an intervention. And the intervention was based on what came out of the survey because the survey showed the dominant uh, behaviors that needed attention. So, We then designed an intervention using th that rich data from the proverbs, from the qualitative data, we designed the intervention. And we went experimental. We're going to do a randomized control trial. And what was important was the way in which we involve the parents in the implementation of the intervention. These were adolescents. These were other people's children. We did not want only to uh, uh, establish relationships only through the community advisory board, but also with the parents of the adolescents. So we did something nice. We wrote uh, letters to the parents to asking them to get involved in this uh, uh, intervention. The children uh, took homework to work with their parents uh, based on the intervention that we're doing. And uh, parents and children uh, got to write uh, 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 a pact. They signed a pact where the children were going to, the adolescents were going to inform their parents of all the activities that we were doing and the parents uh, were going also to help the, the adolescents. So in that way, we were building harmony, peace, we were building relationships between us and the participants and between the participants and their parents. And uh, each day before we started the intervention, the uh, adolescents who had become researchers, they were researchers in the sense that when they got home, they had questions to ask their parents. They sat in, in, in talking circles, talked about what they did with the parents, what they found difficult, and all that was shared with the others. So that the, the adolescents, the groups, they also became one. They also became a group of adolescents who had goals of what they could achieve if they avoided contracting HIV AIDS and so on. So in the end, uh, we can say uh, at the end of the intervention, which was about uh, uh, six, 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 six days, uh, at the end of it all, we again brought the indigenous methods. You, some of you had, have, have heard about yearning. We used the yearning, the ball, where uh, the, uh, the yearning ball, we show strings connecting to each other, and in that way, we, it was showing how these children were going to be connected to one another, and uh, uh, at the end, the, child, the, the adolescent also wrote a promise letter to their parents uh, 
uh, asking them to help them to in, 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 in achieving the goals that they set themselves to do. And so, in the end, we saw our research as building relationships between parents and children, between us and, and, the, uh, and the participants who were the adolescents and their parents. But it was also Western scientific because this was an experiment. At the end of the day, we asked the, parent, the children what they had learned and uh, they told us what they had learned but it was a, res a research that was uh, where we were going to see whether the intervention had made a difference by comparing uh, the baseline data with the data at the end. So no rigor was compromised, but at the same time, a lot of relationship building was brought in and a lot of contextualization of bringing indigenous methodologies was also weaved into the research method. So coming to the end, we say, how do you plan your research using IRM? The first question you see is all about change of mindset. It's not so much about techniques, but more about change of mindset. Why are you carrying the research? Is it this researcher-centric? Is this research going to be changed? Does your research have a clear stance against political, academic, and methodological imperialism of its time? What do you do when you do your literature? Huh? Is the literature the only thing, the, the, the world literature, is it the only literature, or are you going to use other sources as literature? Your songs, your folklore, is that part of your literature as well? So these are some of the questions that you, you can ask yourself uh, when you want to uh, mainstream uh, IRM in your research. Okay. Can you go down? Okay. Of course, it's not easy. There are challenges in doing indigenous research. There is marginalization and rejection of non-conventional methods by the academy. But now, who is the academy? We are the academy. We indigenous people are the academy. Are we marginalizing ourselves? Can we blame anybody for marginalization? Uh, the stigmatization and marginalization of IRM by our African universities. There is isolation and limited access to literature on indigenous research methodologies. And worse still, you have ethic review boards that are not congruent with indigenous research methodologies. And we have undeveloped partnerships between universities and communities. Can you start doing that? And we need, uh, there's an, a challenge in advancing and gaining acceptance of a fifth paradigm, which is an indigenous research paradigm. And so, really, we have to work together. We have to work together to advance scholarship on the fifth paradigm the indigenous research paradigm. We have Sean's book, Research, research is Ceremony. We have indigenous research methodologies. We have uh, African Worldview by Carol. We have book by Lori Lambert. We have book by Margaret Kovac. All this literature helps us to make a strong case and to make visible indigenous research methodologies. Some of the books, okay. And in conclusions, indigenous knowledge communicate values, life experiences, and histories of the African people, indigenous people, and other marginalized groups, stored in stories, songs, and so on. The question is, will you use IK to inform research agenda the research methodologies, or will you leave your indigenous knowledge at the gates 
when we enter the academy. And I end with this quotation from one of my heroes who says, we cannot in all seriousness study ourselves through the eyes of other people's assumptions. I am not saying we must not know what others know or think of us. I am saying we must think for ourselves like others do for themselves. Thank you. <laughs>